This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Seth Grimley on MPB Think Radio. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Good to be with you this morning. We are going to be taking your calls during this hour concerning any type of health care issues that you might have about yourself or someone else that you're concerned about. You can reach us at 1-877-MPB-RING. That's 1-877-672-672. 7464. You can always send an email to us. You can send those to remedy at mpbonline.org. Um, been a couple of weeks. Uh, had some different things going on and uh, good to be back live with you this morning uh, answering those questions. If you're a first time listener, you just happen to uh, stumble onto the station. Um, maybe you're searching for something, maybe you're online and uh, looking for a couple of different things to listen to. Basically, this program uh, is uh, produced to try to get some information out to you. And the best way we know about doing this on Wednesdays is to have lots of people call in. And we usually have great success with that, with people calling in about any kind of health care question that you have. A lot of our other uh, uh, Southern Remedy programs are, are thematic. Uh, in that they deal with certain themes from day to day. We try to open this hour up for, um, for you to uh, send those in, no matter what they are. And uh, they're always good questions. You know, I uh, spoke to some medical students yesterday morning, and uh, it's good to speak to them. I don't do that as much as I used to, uh, but it's, you know, they're, they always can see that in pe- on people's faces that, you uh, that there may be some uh, hesitancy about uh, asking questions. But generally speaking, once that person asks that question, about four or five other people immediately go, you know what, that was the same question I had. I'm glad you asked that. Same thing on the radio. So if you'll send in those questions right now by calling 1-877-MPB-RING, 1-877-672-7464, I guarantee you your question is going to be the same one that probably many other people are wanting to ask. And we do like to share our emails with our larger audience, if you give us permission to do that. And I want to do that uh, right now. So we've got two good questions, two separate issues by one person who, uh, who wrote to us. Their questions are, can gastrointestinal issues also make you dizzy? And I'll deal with that one, and then we'll go to the second question. So uh, gastrointestinal issues can mean a lot of different things to me. So that could mean reflux. It could mean uh, indigestion. It could mean some cramping. It could mean diarrhea, constipation. Uh, The thing about the GI tract is that it is intimately connected through lots of different nerves to help it work appropriately. Uh, It's connected uh, to a lot of different systems. And uh, if, if you'll think about it, the types of pain and discomfort that we experience from our GI tract oftentimes elicits some of the worst sens- sensations. You, th- you think about nausea or vomiting, for instance. For some people, that is such a debilitating thing for just about anybody, uh, unless you're a kid. Kids seem to do with, deal with this a lot better than we do. Uh, if you think about it, you know, a child can uh, vomit and uh, they'll go right back to doing what they what they were doing. If I do that, I'm down for the count for at least 24 hours. Um, but in certain situations, it can make you dizzy with some of those symptoms. And that's because of the way those nerves are hooked up to different systems. So this, the, the nerves that, uh, the vagal nerves that control a lot of those normal processes in our, in our gut, in our GI tract, are also responsible for blood pressure and pulse rates. And in fact, there's a name for this. It's called a vasovagal syncope episode. So vasovagal syncope. So this would mean passing out from in, in response to something that happens to that vagal nerve. So if you stimulate that vagal nerve in a way, and it might be sneezing for, uh, for um, you know, a repetitive amount of time. Or if you're scared, uh, that's a, that could be a vasovagal episode. But it certainly could make you dizzy and even pass out if you have those. 
And there can be secondary causes of this as well. If you're having lots of diarrhea or vomiting episodes, certainly you could become dehydrated if you're not able to keep liquids down, and that could make you dizzy as well. So I would... My advice to you, if you're having some GI issues, and again, I don't know the specifics about those issues in our emailer uh, that uh, uh, situation, but I would I would give probably write all that down and then take that to your physician or your your nurse practitioner or whoever you're seeing, so they can sort of go through that and try to tease out what's going on uh, and to see if those two things are related. Most of the time, if we have two things happen at the same time, most patients, most people would say, well, those are, those are cause, one thing is causing the other. Not necessarily the case. You can have two separate things going on at the same time, but it is possible, particularly with gastrointestinal issues, to have that. So great question there. Just it's a nice little anatomy lesson about how things are hooked up as far as the nerves go and how intimately involved uh, the, the GI tract is. Incidentally, you know, common things that happen neurologically, migraine headaches, for instance, in children especially, you can have what's called an abdominal migraine equivalent. So basically, some kids will um, present with migraines, but they don't have any headache. It's all pain in their gut. So it's all pain in their abdomen. And again, it's because of the way our nerves are hooked up and how they sort of play tricks on us sometimes. The second question that they had was a little bit different. Uh, It said, I have bursitis in both shoulders. Is it okay to get a COVID shot in the arm? Uh, I've had this question a a good bit from a number of of patients. So a little bit of a, you know, what's happening with bursitis. Bursitis is an inflammation of the bursa. A bursa is a, basically a sac of fluid. It's sort of a, a cushion in a joint space to help, or if there's there's tendons or ligaments that are sliding over things, you can have bursa there that help to cushion those uh, as they move back and forth. And if you get inflammation, it can cause pain. Uh, so if it's bursitis in your shoulders, it's there's a number of bursa that are there that are probably inflamed. Now, the location in which you get the COVID vaccine is in the deltoid muscle. So that is well away from the bursa. Uh, if somebody gave you an injection into your bursa, uh, it, you know, from a COVID vaccine, that would be grossly, you know, a- inadequate. It wouldn't be anywhere near where you would give that uh, vaccine. So I think it's fine to do that. Now, you may have some symptoms, you know, one, one of the common symptoms of receiving a COVID vaccine is generalized um, uh, aches and pains. And sometimes that may be in joints that you're already having aches and pains. So it's, you may perceive that, you know, at least in the first 24 hours, but it's not a contraindication from getting the vaccine. And and definitely it's not a direct cause of injection into that bursal space. So, um, so great questions. Hey, send, send your questions. If you're, uh, if you can't uh, call in to the program, uh, you can send those to our email address, remedy at mpbonline.org. The number to call today, uh, if you'd like to talk to us, is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one 672 7464 Usually we have more uh, time to discuss things on the front end of the hour. Uh, and a lot of people are like, well, I'll wait till the back end after a couple of people have called in. And uh, that's a great. We usually have time on the back end, too, to uh, get to everybody. But it is a little bit more rushed, particularly when we're, uh, when we're up against the clock. Uh, and I hate to rush people. I like for them to, you know, for to uh, voice their concerns or their questions adequately. So just keep that in mind. If you uh, if you do have a call, go ahead and call in. Again, that number is one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Doctor Jimmy, if I could jump in for just a minute. Uh, Always. I, I had uh, bursitis in my hip once, I think, uh, years ago, and I was. My experience was, I don't remember exactly what medication I was prescribed, but boy, it sure did the trick because it got to the point when I was walking to where it wouldn't hurt every time, but when it bothered me, it would be enough to almost, you know, not knock me over, or whatever. But uh, as I said, uh, in my case, uh, whatever medication they prescribed uh, certainly did the trick. So is is bursitis usually something that's easy to clear up? Yeah, most of the time it's self-limiting. That's Kevin Farrell, our producer, uh, for everybody out there, the mysterious voice in the booth. Um, uh, So, yeah, bursitis usually is self-limiting. 
it's a little bit harder to get over if you're using whatever joint space that bursa is around uh, repetitively. So things that we, you know, we can't uh, totally uh, uh, stop moving. And actually, that can be worse in some other ways. You can have a frozen joint from that. Now, they do have uh, several different ways to treat that beyond just rest or backing off of some activity that you're doing. Uh, Anti-inflammatory drugs are great. So things like over-the-counter ibuprofen, some of the prescription uh, NSAIDs, uh, doclofenac, those kinds of things can be great. And then occasionally, uh, not, not an injection like you would get from a vaccine, but you can get an injection into that bursal space. And that's one of the ways that orthopedic surgeons uh, and, and physicians, uh, primary care physicians, diagnose this. So you can actually uh, inject into those areas uh, with a little bit of lidocaine, which sort of numbs things up. And you know that you've gotten to the spot when you inject that lidocaine and the pain goes away. And then they can also inject a steroid, a small amount of a steroid uh, medication into that, that space uh, to help with the inflammation. So sometimes you can do that right around where these bursa are, um, so not necessarily inside of it. Uh, but that's, yeah, most of the time it's 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 self-limiting and over-the-counter anti-inflammatory medications are fine. Again, there are some prescription ones. Uh, and if you have problems beyond that, that's the time that you want to go see an orthopedic surgeon. They may want to do some imaging, particularly with an MRI, to, to see where that inflammation is. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart. Thanks for listening to the original Southern Remedy podcast. You can get your medical question answered by sending an email to remedy at mpbonline.org. For a regular dose of medical information, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. The doctor is always in on the original Southern Remedy. Join us each week for Everyday Tech on MPB Think Radio. We have an IT expert, a computer repair ace, and we troubleshoot your problems on the phones as well. Everyday Tech, Wednesdays at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Download the podcast now or listen on YouTube on the MPB Think Radio channel. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Jimmy Stewart with you this morning, answering your questions or uh, hearing your comments about any kind of health care issues that you might have. The number to call is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. We're going to go to the phones now, and uh, I believe we have Jesse on the line from Flowood. Good morning, Jesse. Thank you for calling. Good morning. Um, years back, uh, I had uh, x-rays and uh, MRI done on my lower spine, and was uh, diagnosed with a uh, bulging disc between my L4 and 5, as well as um, uh, stenosis and degenerative disc disease. And they gave me two sets of steroid injections, which have since lost their effectiveness. And I have constant uh, uh, nerve pain shooting down my right leg down to my knee and occasionally down to my ankle. Uh, besides surgery, what sort of long-term options are there for uh, dealing with it? Yeah, Jesse, unfortunately, that's a common problem for a lot of people. So uh, having that bulging disc, um, that's probably what's causing uh, the, the neurologic pain, the nerve pain that we call that uh, radicular pain. It's not radiculous, but it's uh, a radicular pain, that just means that the nerve is being entrapped at some point at the spine level, and it's causing that pain and other sensations that you're having down your leg. The spinal stenosis is a little bit different in that it's really the canal, the central canal in those vertebral bodies where this, the uh, spinal column, the, the, uh, uh, where the, uh, um, your, the, the main bundle of nerves is coming down. So uh, that's a little bit less likely to to be amenable to non-surgical treatments. But there are a couple of things that you could do. And, and it sounds like, you know, the steroid injections, they don't last forever usually. Some people get one and then they don't have to get any any others. But 
a lot of times, particularly if you have uh, disease at this point, uh, and who knows what's changed during that time period, um, that you may need to get some, some injections again. You can get those several times a year. And for some people, that works great in trying to hold off surgery. Surgery, particularly in the lower back, um, at five years, the people who have surgery for particularly disc problems, uh, even if they have symptoms such as yours, at five years, they're about the same as people who didn't have surgery. But for some people, that is the best alternative. So it re- you can relieve pressure on some of those nerves by removing some of that material uh, or by stabilizing those uh, spinal uh, uh, spinal vertebral bodies, uh, the bones in the back a little bit. The spinal stenosis, um, if it's progressive uh, over time, and that you can tell that by either re-imaging or uh, symptoms getting worse, usually that's going to be a surgical, um, you know, a surgical fix for that to get, try to relieve pressure. So um, that of everything you said, that's probably the one that's going to be sort of the driver behind that and it's going to depend on the symptoms that you have so the most successful people are ones that are seeing somebody either an orthopedic surgeon or a neurosurgeon that is very experienced in these areas um, and in conjunction with physical therapy and maybe pain management as well so those are your alternative treatments at this point but uh, i would try to get hooked up with the pain specialist just to see if they can do something um you know, at the, the level of where you're having the problem, like the injections. Uh, I'm not a big fan of medications. Some medications, you know, the non-opioid medications can be uh, of, of a little bit of use. So uh, those are things like gabapentin, Lyrica, and they can help with, with um, you know, with chronic pain, particularly if it involves the nerves. Uh, but this is the main problem is you got pressure on these nerves. So Trying to relieve that and relieve any kind of inflammation you have around those areas is probably your best bet. All right. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate it. Sure, Jesse. Good luck to you. This is uh, Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. I'm Dr. Jimmy with you this morning, answering your calls and comments about any kind of health care issues that you might have. Got an email here about some blood pressure questions. I always uh, love to hear those questions. So it says, uh, a question about blood pressure and aging. Can you please explain the dynamics of blood pressure medications and salt on the systolic reading? As you have described, as we age, our blood vessels harden over time, and the result is an increase in the pressure as the heart exerts greater force to push blood through the arteries. If so, what does the medication do? What do medications do to relieve that pressure? Do they thin the blood? Do they make the arteries more pliable? And what does salt have to do uh, with the blood pressure? Does it thicken the blood? Does it speed the hardening of the arteries? Thank you for considering these questions. So thanks for those questions. Those are really good. Um, Blood pressure is a complex system. It is, uh, there's different systems in the body to help maintain adequate blood pressure, not just from a day-to-day standpoint, but also when we have rapid changes in the the needs for blood flow to different tissues. For instance, if uh, for some reason you have a serious uh, injury where you cut yourself and you lose a lot of blood, there are changes to the blood pressure systemically, not just at that site, but systemically to help maintain blood flow to your kidneys, to your brain, to your heart, to the vital organs while you're recovering from that. Um, There are also other systems that help maintain uh, the blood pressure during different uh, situations like dehydration. If you're out on a hot Mississippi uh, summer day and you're sweating a lot, Uh, There's a lot of different mechanisms that come into play to help maintain your blood pressure despite having maybe a liter or two of fluids that you lose during that period that you're outside. So these systems are uh, more than one. So there's not just one that controls that. It's not just the nerves, although that's one system. It's also uh, some of the things that the kidney does or many different things that the kidney does in response to that in producing some hormones that help control uh, and some regulators that help control blood pressure. And then there's things at, at the local tissue level uh, that help shunt blood to different places by constricting certain arteries. So, um, you know, salt, we know that there is a direct correlation in populations of people that the more salt that you have in your diet, 
not just what you add, but the salt that's in there, uh, that you as a, as a population, like a city or a region, you're going to have higher blood pressures when, con- when compared to populations that have lower salt intake. Now, individual to individual, there may be some variations, but if you take, say, a Western, typical Western diet with lots of salt in it and compare that to another group of people who probably have similar health patterns uh, but have a lower salt intake, you can show a difference. You can also show a difference from a treatment standpoint in reducing the amount of salt that an individual uh, takes in and, and see a decrease in blood pressure in those individuals. Now, there's many different mechanisms. There's a, a fluid uh, retention effect. There's a <coughs> different systems that the, sydney, the uh, kidneys help to um, regulate salt and water um, balance in the body. So all of that comes into play. It's not They don't really thicken the blood by eating too much uh, salt, uh, but we do know there's a direct correlation there. And if you're on blood pressure medications, it's going to be a little bit harder to control the blood pressure if you have higher amounts of salt intake. As to blood pressure medications and how they uh, how they work, it's really about targeting those different areas um, of blood pressure management. So for instance, if you're on an ACE inhibitor, those would be medications that end in PRIL, so like lisinopril uh, or moexapril or uh, the the other uh, ACE inhibitors they're going to work on a system that the kidney uses to help regulate blood pressure. So it's not getting rid of fluid necessarily, but it's on the, working on the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system uh, to help block certain areas of that to lower your blood pressure. If you're on a diuretic, that's a whole other system. So something like hydrochlorothiazide or chlorthalidone, those work on a totally different system. Uh, a beta blocker uh, is another common class of medications and those work on the nervous system and at the tissue level to help dilate or relax those blood vessels. Another thing to keep in mind, too, is that all of our arterioles, the arteries, uh, the small arteries where blood pressure is actually managed, it they have small circles of muscle around each of those arterioles. And that, if you relax those muscles, you can lower blood pressure if they constrict harder. Uh, around those blood vessels. They tighten up and the total volume is compressed throughout the whole system and your blood pressure will go up. So it's not a static thing like that. When we talk about hardening the arteries, that's really on the inside of the blood vessel wall. So it's a really complex uh, system. We hit it from different um, aspects, different uh, parts of the of the control mechanisms, and most people will have to have between two and three medications hitting each of those different systems to adequately control blood pressure to go. You can help it out by doing things like losing weight, reducing your salt intake, and trying to eat foods that are healthier for you. We know that processed foods, again, sort of a Western diet, that's less healthy for you in eating that from a blood pressure standpoint than it is eating a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables, lower in red meat, and lower in animal fats. So, uh, a lot of science behind that. It took me a long time to uh, to even get to the basics of that. So, you know, four years of med school, four years of residency, and then about two to three years of uh, some further hypertension experience and training to learn about those di- different mechanisms. So it's not real simple as you would think of just putting somebody on the medication. There's lots of things going on in the background that uh, your physician needs to understand about that. But great question and one that I always love talking about. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart. Thanks for listening to the original Southern Remedy podcast. You can get your medical question answered by sending an email to remedy at mpbonline.org. For a regular dose of medical information, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. The doctor is always in on the original Southern Remedy. Hello, I'm Dr. Nancy Lotridge Anderson, president of New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advising firm and co-host of Money Talks. For over 10 years, Money Talks has been answering your personal financial questions and sharing knowledge about money management. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. 
podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart device's podcasting platform. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning answering your questions and emails, uh, email questions about any kind of health care topic that you might have. The number to call right now if you have any questions is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one 672 We're going to go to Sue in Beaumont. Good morning, Sue. So glad to talk to you this morning. Good morning. I want to ask you a question about salt. It- I don't keep a salt shaker on the table. I don't keep a box of salt next to the stove, so I won't add any extra salt to anything. And I've tried these salt substitutes, and if you read the fine print, it's potassium, I think. It's, what it, it's terrible. Right. Nobody buys that stuff anymore. But um, I want to ask you, is there, could you get your sodium level too low? Is there a possibility that your sodium level could get too low? And what would happen if it got too low? Yeah. So that's a great question. So there is, um, there are some some conditions where your sodium level can get too low. Thankfully, you know, from an intake standpoint, uh, even if you're reducing salt uh, a good bit, you're still probably going to get enough in your diet. So there's other mechanisms. Sometimes there's a problem at the kidney level, or there's a problem with the brain's um, uh, system that it helps to regulate sodium. Sodium is an important electrolyte that the body uses for a lot of different processes for muscular contraction for uh for adequately functioning nerves you need sodium in your body so um all of those are very uh you know very important but a sodium restricted diet by itself almost never is the cause from getting the sodium too low um you know ideally um, you know, we like to say, uh, the, you know, if you look at the AHA guidelines, the American Heart Association guidelines, it's less than 2,300 milligrams of sodium uh, would be great, uh, and that's in a, in a day. Uh, and again, as you said, it's not just what you put on foods, what you add to it, but what is actually in the food as well. So if you have to look at the labels and things and sort of calculate that out. And then ideally, you know, for the best benefits, Less than 1,500 milligrams a day would be great, uh, particularly if you have high blood pressure. But there may be some other reasons, you know, why your sodium is low. And it may not be related to the amount of sodium that you're taking in. It's also sodium goes hand in hand with with water uh, regulation. So uh, the way that you're, you know, if you if your kidneys weren't working appropriately, you could drink a lot of water. You could actually dilute out your sodium that you have in the in your serum. And that would cause some problems as well. So it's those kinds of shifts, too. Some people who have heart failure have problems with lower sodiums. Uh, you can have cirrhosis of the liver, and that can be associated with lower sodiums for, for various reasons. So all those things can be sort of, uh, you know, get sodium too dangerously low. If it gets really, really low, like if it gets below about 120, 125, if you look at your labs, uh, you're start probably going to have some at least feeling uh, very tired, uh, you may have some nausea. Uh, you may have some changes in your in your reflexes if somebody's measuring those in your muscle muscle uh, muscle tone. Uh, but if it gets much below about 115 or so, you can run into some real problems. Maybe even have seizures from that. But it's not as much of a deal for for the vast majority of the population. Decreasing your sodium intake is not going to cause your sodium level to get too low. You're still getting adequate num- levels of, uh, of sodium in your diet. The other, the other time this comes up is people ask me about calcium. Can you, uh, you know, can you, um, can you get too much calcium? If somebody tells you, you know, that you need to take it for osteoporosis or osteopenia. And, and there are instances when calcium intake can be too much, but sodium's a little bit different. We know that most people get way too much. You know, I said 2,300 and 1,500 milligrams are sort of our cutoffs. Uh, most people, particularly in the South, a lot of them are eating like eight to 9,000 milligrams a day. So we are way over our limit of, uh, of sodium, and the body's working extra hard to try to get rid of that. 
But great question, Sue, as, as usual. Thank you. All right, this is Southern Remedy. Uh, Dr. Jimmy with you this morning. The number to call is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. We've got a couple of more emails here. Um, you know, of course, we have a lot of good one about uh, COVID vaccines. Why don't we? Uh, here's one about um, something that happened to a listener's thumb. So it says about a month ago, I hurt my thumb using kitchen shears to cut through some turkey bones. When it happened, I felt like an electric shock in the nerve where my thumb contacted the shears. The pain has subsided for the most part, but I can still feel a little bit of pain if I rub the inside of my first joint. What's more troubling to me is that I've begun to lose feeling in the tip of my thumb. It feels numb all the time, and I can't feel the buttons on the TV remote. A medical friend suggested it might be arthritis and that ibuprofen might help with the pain. He didn't have any suggestion about the numbness, however, and that's what is most concerning to me. I don't have arthritis anywhere else, and the movement of my thumb has not been affected. What could explain the numbness, and what should I do about it? Um, so they, um, so this is a common uh, complaint. Basically, what this sounds like is that you have a, a direct pressure injury to that nerve. So the nerves, once you get out to the hands, a lot of our nerves are deep inside of our body. So they go along neurovascular bundles. So usually they travel with blood vessels, both arteries and veins together. And, uh, you know, the bigger they are, the more protected they are. But then once they get out into the periphery, particularly in the, in the hands and the feet, they're pretty exposed, uh, relatively speaking. So they, you can, uh, you know, you can, uh, if you get a cut, over an area on your hand, you can sever some of those uh, cutaneous nerves that are responsible for sensation and, and sometimes movement of those. And it sounds like you had a direct pressure injury to one of the nerves that supplies uh, the sensation for your hand, for your thumb. Um, those can, can recover with time. Usually speaking, if you... Um, you know, if you injure that with a sort of a crush or a, um, a pressure injury, uh, most of the time, you, you know, we do that when our legs go to sleep. I, this happens to me all the time. If I sit in one position a long time, I get up and I can't feel my, my foot. And then it, it, over the course of a few minutes, it uh, comes back. And that's just because you've put pressure on that nerve uh, and you've caused some reversible temporary damage to that. If it's, if it's bad enough, though, you can have a crush injury to the nerve, and that takes longer to heal. As long as that nerve is not severed, most of the time that can that nerve can grow back within the sheath. It has this sort of sheath that helps protect it. Um, and but that is a long, slow process. So we're talking about weeks to a month uh, of growing, of, or months of growing back, even if it's the distance from uh, you know of, of how long your thumb is. And usually that's about a millimeter a day if you're young. The older you get, the slower that process is, and there are some things that can harm that. If you ingest large amounts of caffeine, that can have an effect on the blood flow to that area, particularly in your fingers, uh, or if you smoke. Those two things can dramatically slow down that healing process. So I would encourage you to, you know, if you're doing both of those things, be a good time to, to cut back or quit. Uh, and if you're not getting an improvement within about a, you know, uh, a few weeks, uh, if, or if it's been that, that uh, amount already, you may want to see a hand surgeon. So these are either orthopedic or plastic surgeons who have some extra training, uh, and they are well familiar with some of the nerves uh, and nerve injuries uh, to the hand like that. And they may, they may suggest some different things. But uh, particularly if this is in your dominant hand, you know, you, we use our thumbs a lot. Uh, it doesn't sound like this is arthritis. You may have some arthritis, but this sounds more like an, an injury to uh, the nerve itself, so one of the cutaneous nerves. So that would be my recommendations for you. do appreciate those, uh, those calls, uh, those emails, rather. This is Southern Remedy. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning answering your calls and emails. The number to call if you would like to call in this morning is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven. Six seven two seven four six four. So a couple of COVID updates. Um, as a whole, Mississippi and the rest of the nation is doing very well. 
Um, you know, a lot of people are sort of confused. Thomas Dobbs, I saw, had posted something, I think it was either yesterday or the day before, uh, Dr. Dobbs posted a, a, a very good explanation of somebody had, had raised the question, if our vaccination rates are so low in the state, uh, which are still not where we would like to see them, why are we seeing cases plummet right now? Uh, shouldn't we still be seeing a high number of cases? You had to take into consideration the people who had COVID within the last year who have some natural immunity from that. That, in conjunction with vaccinations, has certainly driven our rates down, uh, and that's that's the main reason why we're not having those. But there is a lot of concern, particularly from some of the variants. Uh, I've talked to you about a couple of the variants back when we had our first ones out of England. Uh, they have long names. Thankfully, now they have switched to a Greek alphabet system. Uh, the, the one that most people are, are worried about right now, or at least looking at intently in the United States, is the Delta variant. Uh, the Delta variant is that's not the Mississippi Delta. Um, it is uh, from uh, India is where it was first uh, described. It is it, in, in a person who is not vaccinated, it is much easier to contract the Delta variant, and it seems to have worse outcomes uh, as far as hospitalizations and other complications, including death. The good news is if you are vaccinated, that you still have really good immunity to the Delta, to the Delta variant. So if you've been vaccinated with any of the vaccines that are available in the United States, you should have good immunity. Now, it's not as good as like the original, um, the Alpha variant, of the, the first uh, wild type COVID uh, virus, uh, had about you know 90 to 95 percent immunity uh, for both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. Um, the Delta variant is about 88 percent, so still really good as far as vaccinations go. Not as good though. Uh, there was an email question about this, and it says, uh, "From my understanding, the vaccine doesn't prevent you from contracting the virus, and it also doesn't prevent transmission. So, how does a COVID-19 vaccination work?" against transmission. If it doesn't prevent transmission, why ditch the mask? And three, if it doesn't uh, prevent transmission, which one of the main causes, which is one of the main causes for alarm, what's the purpose of the vaccine? So I think this is a little bit of misinformation here, and I've heard this a couple of times. So uh, the whole reason for getting a vaccine is to uh, use the body's in, uh, immune system to develop uh, in this case, antibodies and long-term memory against the virus to help protect you when you are exposed to it. And these, this is in the form of antibodies is sort of our first line defense against that. Um, and uh, certainly all of the vaccines, again, that we've received here, they do that. So they, they present in different ways, uh, you know, whether it's messenger RNA or, or sort of a more traditional um, vaccine uh, like the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, they present the body certain aspects or use the body systems to produce certain molecules and proteins that help the body recognize the virus before it's actually contracted it so that when it is exposed, it will be ready to produce those neutralizing antibodies to help stop transmission. So all three of those vaccines do decrease transmission rates so it's not like you're going to get it and just not have any symptoms and spread it to somebody else. And they are effective in doing that. Again, if you're talking about Pfizer and Moderna, about 95% of the time uh, and a little less with uh, Johnson & Johnson, but still really good. If you're in that 5% or so, uh, then it's a little bit more variable. So you could have uh, the full-blown COVID uh, uh, syndrome and all the different um, um, uh, bad complications from that, or you might have mild sy symptoms. We know that people who are vaccinated, if they do get the virus, have milder symptoms. So uh, it does work against transmission. Masks help with that. And, it, you know, certainly we have uh, been given uh, the go ahead in, in most of our interactions in different situations to not have to wear the mask. But we do know that in higher risk situations, it's still beneficial and can reduce our transmission of that, not to mention other things like the flu. So that's why in nursing homes, in hospitals, 
and other healthcare settings, we're still recommending that individuals wear those masks. Uh, or if you're an individual that is at greater risk, you can still help protect yourself and other people by wearing that mask if you're around other people. Um, so it's in conjunction that we're doing that. It's not it doesn't mean that just because we've got good rates on uh, decreasing the transmission and how bad uh, COVID will affect somebody. So um, that's the purpose of the vaccine really is to decrease that transmission and to decrease all the bad effects from it. Um, now, it, if it if if this is hypothetical, if it just uh, decreased um, the symptoms, it would still be a win, right? So we would still, that would be great, but it, it works even better than that. It actually decreases transmission of uh, the virus um, and actually prevents you from contracting it. Um, another way to think about this is there's a number of viral particles that you have to get to. Um, and at that point, then you're considered to be infectious. Um, many people will, will be familiar with this. If you, if you had the virus, uh, if you contracted COVID, you were not vaccinated, you contracted COVID and you, um, you were infectious for a certain period of time. But if we tested you after that period, so if we tested you 10 days after you contracted that, uh, the, after you started showing symptoms and you were fever free, we could still test your, the back of your throat and find viral particles but you are not infectious. In other words, you're not able to transmit that to somebody else. So it, it's an important concept that there's a certain number of particles that you have to be exposed to. And that's, again, why masks work, even though they may not decrease 100% of all the viral particles that you're exposed to. So if you reduce that number down enough, even if you're not vaccinated, you're still going to reduce your chances of getting that virus. So uh, it's not just like one viral particle that, that sneaks in and you've got the virus. There's most of the time there's there's thousands of particles. I don't know. I'm sort of conjecturing on the number. I don't think anybody really knows what the true number is. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart. Thanks for listening to the original Southern Remedy podcast. You can get your medical question answered by sending an email to remedy at mpbonline.org. For a regular dose of medical information, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. The doctor is always in on the original Southern Remedy. Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking, is a show that explores issues that relate to you and your family. To find out what we're all about, subscribe to the podcast by using any podcast app or by downloading our MPB public media app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. This is Southern Remedy on MPB Think Radio. Dr. Jimmy with you this morning, answering your questions via email or phone calls about all kinds of good stuff. Uh, if you aren't able to call in today to our program, we have just a few minutes left to talk about one, other, one or two other issues. Uh, email us. We do love to get to your emails. We try to respond back to you as soon as we can. Also share those if you give us permission with our listening audience. The email address is remedy at mpbonline.org. And check out our website, mpbonline.org. If you want to listen to previous programs, check out our archive there. You can just search for Southern Remedy and pull those up. So, Dr. Jimmy, I had a follow-up on our blood pressure discussion. I think you were saying that uh, the different medications kind of work with different systems in the body to help control blood pressure. Um, so with different people, do different medications work with those systems better than others? And then so how do you decide which type of medication to attack high blood pressure with? Yeah, that's sort of the art of the question. It's based on some data. Uh, so so in, we, we do know and have good data because most of the blood pressure trials looked at, at least the ones after the, the, uh, the early 90s, did try to include groups of people and analyses of, of people uh, to see if maybe some some types of medications work better. So, in, for instance, if you're a white male and you're 
elderly, what works better in you as com- you know compared to a black female who's younger? Um, so we do have a little bit of that data. So we know that you know thiazides, for instance, diuretics tend to work better in the the black uh, population than in white. Although for most people, thiazide diuretics are still sort of the mainstay. So even though there are some differences from you know from different groups of people, and we do sort of lean towards those, um, and we also lean away from using some. If I, have, if I have an elderly person who's hypertensive, uh, I may not use a beta blocker because of increased risk for falls in that uh, individual because I'm going to be lowering blood pressure and pulse rate uh, in those individuals. So there's lots of different things than the individual that we may take into consideration. Uh, pulse rate is one, activity level. If they have other medical problems, uh, although we're usually treating the blood pressure with all these blood pressure medications, there may be some other things that we treat at the same time. For instance, the ACE inhibitors, the angiotensin receptor blockers, those are two classes that are very useful in people who have heart disease, particularly heart failure. Um, so we want to make sure if we're treating their blood pressure that those one of those two classes is included uh, in their blood pressure regimen. Uh, same thing with some other, you know, kidney disease is another one that they have a compelling indication to use a certain class, which is the sort of the, the language that we use in that. So, so there are some reasons to do that. But again, a lot of times it's a, it's a, even within all that data, it is an individual and we have to sort of trial and error through that to see what works best to try to avoid side effects, but get the blood pressure controlled. So that's always our goal. Our main goal is to control that blood pressure to their goal uh, with as few medications and as few side effects. And again, don't want to underemphasize in any way um, the importance of lifestyle modifications, particularly those things that you can change. That can always help out the medications to work better and can sometimes get you off of a medication. I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart. Thanks for listening to the original Southern Remedy podcast. You can get your medical question answered by sending an email to remedy at mpbonline.org. For a regular dose of medical information, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. The doctor is always in on the original Southern Remedy. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio. Or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite